Archbishop Philip Hannon was a remarkable man, a true shining example of what it means to serve God. A veteran combat chaplain of World War II, Archbishop Hannon knew firsthand the horrors of war and the bravery required of fellow chaplains whose job is to deliver the word and compassion of God while surrounded by death and uncertainty. Focus presents the heroic story of one of these chaplains, the Grunt Padre, a hero and servant of God who valiantly gave his life to defend his fellow Marines during the Vietnam War. The jungle warfare against huge communist forces in Vietnam was a deadly and unique challenge to our United States forces. The limited American forces faced an unlimited number of communist forces who also had the incomparable advantage of a sanctuary for their replacements beyond the 18th parallel. The U.S. government granted this sanctuary fearing that any military action beyond it would cause reprisals by communist China. In South Vietnam, our troops could not distinguish enemy from friendly Vietnamese. A village could be friendly by day and enemy by night. It was a battlefield with no boundaries. A secret supply route in nearby Laos funneled a constant arms supply to the enemy. The jungle provided perfect cover for the enemy, constantly posing ambushes from the rear and flanks of our troops. Bayonet and gun butt, hand-to-hand -hand fighting was frequent. Capture by the enemy could mean torture in a communist prison camp. The constant unbearable heat with high humidity enervated our troops. The unstable South Vietnamese political situation crippled their war efforts, bitterly opposed political factions, caused the assassination of President Diem by a military coup whose leaders then could not unify the country. Meanwhile, in the U.S., the drumbeat of communist propaganda split the citizens of the U.S., especially our youth. Despite all these odds, the U.S. forces had practically knocked out the communist forces in South Vietnam by mid-1966, when new and highly trained North Vietnamese communist forces poured into South Vietnam. Such was the daunting situation faced by our troops when Father Vincent Capadano arrived as a chaplain for a regiment of our Marines. Chaplain Vincent Capadano, at whose statue we're standing here in Staten Island, New York, treasured the strange title given to him by his admiring fellow Marines, the Grunt Padre, an honored title among Marines in combat. He earned that title by his experience in severe combat in many places, but especially near a small town deep in the jungle of Vietnam on September the 4th, 1967, where about 400 Marines held off a force of trained communist veterans, five times their number. Father, ministering physically and spiritually to the many wounded and dying there, had his right hand practically shot off, then his right arm, but refusing aid he continued his ministry to the wounded and to the dying and responded to the call of a wounded medic in an exposed position where help really could not get to him. Father crawled to the side of that medic, shielded him with his body, and then comforted him with the words, stay quiet, Marine. God is with us all this day. 
Instantly, his body was riddled by a burst of enemy machine gun fire. The United States government has awarded to Father, with its highest military decoration, the Congressional Medal of Honor. His fellow Marines have called him a saint. Hello, everybody. I'm Archbishop Philip M. Hannon, former chaplain, 82nd Airborne Division, World War II. And I have the honor of presenting to you the life of Chaplain Vincent Cappadano. Vincent Capadano Jr. was born on February the 13th, 1929, in his family's home in Elm Park, Staten Island, New York. There was uh, nine of us, mm -hmm. and mom and pop made 11, and then we had a dog, Dorney. Mom always had a big gang, and she cooked. She had the table filled with food, right. always. We weren't rich, mm -hmm. but we, were, we had food, plenty of food to eat. We developed the habit of going to Mass on William Street, Our Lady of Victory Parish, in the morning, and then having breakfast together in a wonderful restaurant nearby. When did you know that Father V wanted to go to be, be a priest? Oh, well, I, I really didn't. None of us knew. Is that right? No, nobody knew. He didn't talk we about had, those My things. brother Philip used to be an altar boy, uh -huh. and we always thought that he would go to, a, to a, the uh, priesthood. And uh, Vincent would go with the uh, being a medical doctor. I see. Because he had poor ha hand handwriting. And then he was he went to Fordham. He was working in New York, downtown New York, mm -hmm. for an insurance company. And uh, then he had gone. He was going to Fordham at night. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when he decided he was going to be a priest. Right. When he was going to Fordham. But I didn't have any idea of it. Uh -huh. Vincent told me. He said. You know, I had I felt called to the priesthood in grade school, and I said no. And again in high school, and I said no. But he said, it's come back again, mm -hmm. and I can't say no anymore. I have to think about it and go. Vincent entered the Mary Knowles Seminary on June the 25th, 1949. I was honored that he went. Fine. And, and, was, you know, and everybody, and became, everybody, everybody supported sure, him in the family. Sure, everybody did. Mom yeah. was a little surprised, you know, because she felt like, in those times, she felt like you're losing a son, you know. Right, sure. But uh, she went right along with it after that. He said, Bill, uh, why don't you think about this? I think you have a vocation. Well, frankly, that was the farthest thing from my <laughs> mind at the time. Uh -huh. you know, I was working at a good job and all the rest. Uh -huh. So, I don't know, he put the bug in my ear. So we ended up going into Mary Knoll in August of 1949. He shall triumph, he shall triumph for... Vincent Capadonna was ordained in June 1958. He was one of the 48 who was ordained. Yes. Together with you. Yeah. We were ordained by Cardinal Spellman. Archbishop Cardinal of New York Archdiocese mm -hmm. and had a close association with Marino. It was just a very beautiful June day and it was a very nice day. We had just got our, uh, our mission assignments about six weeks before that and he was assigned over to Taiwan. On August the 4th, 1958, Father Vincent Capadonna was sent to Formosa, Taiwan as a Mary Knoll missionary. I would write to him when he was in Taiwan, and I remember very well he wrote back and he said that uh, his mission state station was next to a Buddhist temple, mm -hmm. and the Buddhists had many funerals all day long, mm -hmm. and uh, they played music at the funerals. Mm -hmm. And one of their favorite songs was, I wonder who's kissing her now. <laughs> they didn't know the words, but they liked the tune, and they'd play it as a dirge. It would have been my fifth year in Taiwan, and the Father Vince's second year. He had had a year of language study in Miaoli, the county seat nearby, and his second year assigned to a veteran 
Hakka speaking missioner, Father Maynard Murphy, who is pastor of Tung Lo. After six years of service in Taiwan, Father Vincent was forced to make a drastic change in his life. But he was assigned from Taiwan to come to, to Hong Kong to teach English in uh, some of the high schools there. Well, we were surprised that he was assigned to Hong Kong because originally uh, he was assigned to, Hong, to Taiwan and had learned Hakka. Mm -hmm. The language in, in, in Hong Kong is Cantonese. Mm -hmm. He was not very happy about that assignment because I don't think he was consulted about it mm -hmm. and he was just assigned out. And um, the one thing we do have is kind of obedience. Sure. So he came. Um, but I don't think he was very happy about the assignment. Mm -hmm. Looking for a different challenge, Father Capadano requested a new assignment as a Navy chaplain serving with the U.S. Marines. He specifically requested to serve the soldiers in Vietnam. On August the 13th, 1965, Bishop Comber finally consented to Father Vincent's repeated requests and gave him permission to begin the process of military induction. At last, paperwork and training behind him, Father Vincent reached his goal. During Holy Week of April 1966, he stepped onto the soil of Vietnam where he would serve as a chaplain for the 7th Regiment, 1st Marine Division. Did it surprise you when you learned that he had become a chaplain in combat and that he actually was very devoted to these uh, to the men. It surprised me in the sense that it was a completely different type of work than Marinoles are usually involved in. It didn't surprise me in this sense that I know he, he wanted something that he could get into and, and really give himself to completely. So uh, he, he saw this uh, opportunity or this call and he uh, yeah. responded. Yeah. So when I heard about him in Vietnam, I was not uh, surprised, you know, that he was a hero. He was a person that I, one could depend upon and who would f follow through. He was a good, mm -hmm. solid person that way. He really felt he, that he was being what, well used, if you want, right. you know. Uh, and, he, and he found some place where he could really give himself as a, as a, as a priest, as a minister, uh, in working with these young men. When I first arrived in Vietnam, uh, I heard the chaplain say, Capitano this, Capitano that. What a great man he was. And I conjured in my mind this great, big, gregarious Italian, a back slapper, loud, and uh, ju ju just uh, mixes with the troops and all that. And uh, so that's what I had pictured in my mind. And as I approached, I, I saw this gaunt-looking man who was all bones and muscle, wiry. and. He raised this chalice mm -hmm. above his head, and he was so graceful. Mm -hmm. I thought, my goodness, this is like a ballet. Mm -hmm. he, he, he did it with such, a, such intensity and such grace that it had to emanate from his heart. Mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. once um, thought watching him at mass that he was like the Pied Piper mm -hmm. and just attracting everybody mm -hmm. to mass. And everybody, regardless of their faith, as he performed general absolution, mm -hmm. was making the sign of the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a most remarkable situation. Mm -hmm. And his homily was just designed to reach the Marines at a very, very basic level. He didn't look down on them, and he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, lecture them, he supported them. He, he was there for their spiritual uh, well-being, not, not, um, not to be a nanny or a, uh, you know, a proctor, uh, but to support their spiritual needs, and they understood that. And you know, he's an intelligent man, he was well-educated, uh, but he talked to them and with hands in the pocket and, and that in their language that they can understand. And they knew they were talking to, if not an equal, a friend, mm -hmm. somebody that they could depend on, mm -hmm. somebody that they can relate to. Well, let me ask you this. You're not a Catholic, and he seemed to be acceptable to everybody. Is that right? He was um, absolutely ecumenical. <laughs> uh, Father Capadano uh, provided an awful lot of spiritual 
sucker for uh, whatever denomination you might be. When he would say mass, uh, it was n not uncommon to have the, the local women with their mm -hmm. rice conical hats, mm -hmm. black mm -hmm. pajamas, mm -hmm. babies strapped on their back. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were Catholic. Most of them were Buddhist, mm -hmm. a lot of them were Catholic. They would come, stand around the back, wait for mass mm -hmm. to come. Mm -hmm. And then after mass, and everyone, you never knew who was a Catholic, who wasn't. It didn't make any difference. They all came because here's a man of God, mm -hmm. carried a few thoughts. And after the Mass, uh, people wouldn't leave. You know how we all leave church a little early sometimes? Right. They wouldn't leave. They'd mm -hmm. stay. But as long as Father would stay, they would stay. Although Father was delighted to fulfill every duty of a chaplain, there was a hitch to his serving in combat. His immediate commanding officer wanted him to be protected from the enemy in combat. The senior Catholic officer, Major Anthony Grimm, was assigned the task of providing that protection. He, when he uh, dubbed me the, the senior mackerel snapper, he did so, which, and the mackerel snapper is a common Marine Corps and Navy expression for Catholics. That's right. Yeah, it's not disparaging that's in any right. way. No, that's but um, he did so uh, uh, when he assigned me responsibility for Father Capitano, basically to make, him, make sure he stayed safe. In particular, to keep an eye on him and keep him from slipping out through the wire with patrols that went out, because he, he liked to accompany patrols. He liked to be with the troops. He wanted to accompany them in, 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 uh, in their dangerous situations, in their normal duties. Um, I was also told that he would have an assistant assigned to him, which we commonly called a shotgun, because the assistant's job was to ride shotgun or be protection for him. Right. And, and Father Capitano said, no way. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to have anybody responsible for his life. He, he, he just couldn't accept that, that uh, somebody might become a casualty because they were protecting him. Was that a normal procedure there for? To, to have a, a chaplain's assistant, it was. It was? Yes. I said, to protect the chaplain. To protect the chaplain. But he, he liked to be independent, go mm -hmm. where he wanted to go, when he wanted to go, mm -hmm. and, and not be under any restrictions. We, we discussed this over a period of about two days. And it, um, I said, all right, if you don't have a chaplain's assistant assigned to you, you're going to carry a weapon. Mm -hmm. You're going to carry a 45, and he got angry, mm -hmm. and uh, he got very angry with me, and he said, do you realize what you're asking me to do? I'm a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. I can't carry a weapon, and I said, you've got a choice. Mm -hmm. It's either the 45 or a chaplain's assistant. Uh, this, of course, is always a controversial subject. Uh, most Navy chaplains that I knew never were armed, and he refused to to carry an arm. He felt that he didn't need it, that it, would, uh, not, it wouldn't convey the right message to the Marines if he was armed. And he never was armed with anything but the Bible and the wonderful words of encouragement. Chaplain Cappadano knew that his true calling was not to carry a gun, but rather to give strength, comfort, and courage to his men by ministering to their medical and spiritual needs. He did so fearlessly running straight into dangerous territory, going wherever his men needed him the most. He always wanted to be with the unit that would be in the greatest danger. That's true, yes. How was he able to work that? Because it seems to me that uh, he goes in and out of assignments. That is, he's, he's assigned a battalion, but all of a sudden you find out that he's in another sector. Well, he would always attend, always attend the briefings that we had before we had an operation. And we would, the S2 officer, the intelligence mm -hmm. officer, would get up and uh, make his briefing with the maps, and he would point out where he felt that the strongest resistance mm -hmm. would be, uh, would be uh, felt by the Marines. And Father Capadano could identify which company was going, mm -hmm. and all he had to do was go to the landing zone where those helicopters would, were going to land and just get on one of the helicopters. He pretty much had a free hand to go where he wanted to go when he was in the field. Nobody told him that uh, he shouldn't do this or that. 
came over the radio that we we're trying to cross the stream and the streams were swollen pretty heavy and uh, uh, we were out there for 30 days they tried to get across the stream and the only way they could do it was lock arms and get across the stream well the chain of marines broke two marines got washed away they they weren't swimmers they both drowned and uh, they were trying to recover the bodies and it came over the radio and i i heard about it and, and i saw the chaplain i said uh, bravo company just lost a couple of kids trying to cross that creek up there it's kind of swollen and he said where are they i said well they're a couple of clicks away from here being clicks being kilometers mm -hmm. and uh, he didn't even ask the colonel or anything he just took off by himself mm -hmm. out in out in the badlands and uh, we were in the jungles just went off by himself and I, I, I didn't say anything to anything, anybody. And how he found those Marines is, is uh, he just had, had divine guidance to find mm -hmm. them. But anyway, it was just like a, a, a shot out of a movie. Here comes Capadano mm -hmm. leading the company. He's coming back in. And they got the two Marines up in the front, and they'd ripped the doors off of some hooches. Mm -hmm. And they were carrying them on, like on their shields. There's six mm -hmm. Marines carrying mm -hmm. these two Marines dead on their shields, bringing them back in the battalion CP so we could evacuate them by, by helicopter. But uh, that just one little act mm -hmm. of him finding those Marines, mm -hmm. giving them the last rites and bringing them back and mm -hmm. finding it, you know, all by himself, I just thought mm -hmm. there must have been a trail that he was following or something. To be, somebody, he had some type of guidance. Shortly after I first met him, uh, Father Capadano uh, slipped out on a platoon-sized patrol with me. Uh, which he uh, was absolutely forbidden to do. He was so courageous and uh, so committed to going out with the troops that the battalion commander, as I recall, had forbidden him to go out with anything other than the battalion headquarters, but it didn't make a di bit of difference to Father Capadano. He just, he just would go anyway. He moved from unit to unit. He did that in a way that was very unique. As he moved, and as he began to go from unit to unit, the troops would identify with him. And by the way, Father Mode's description of as the infantry grunt priest mm -hmm. is absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. He would move from company size to company size. Sometimes the, the men would just be coming out of the field mm -hmm. or getting ready to go into the field, and we had operations going every day. There were men, new arrivals coming in, new replacements. Men were wounded, men died. Mm -hmm. So he lived in this world spread out as a man of want that mm -hmm. would go from unit to unit, in a jeep or walk, whatever necessary to get there. But after the first or second time he'd been to that unit and he tried to hit every one of them at least once a week, they would wait for him. He was ecumenical in every mm -hmm. sense of the word. They became every Marine, every Navy corpsman would be looking down the road mm -hmm. <laughs> to see when Father's coming, they say, hey, he's over at Charlie Company today, he'll be here this afternoon, and so forth. And so they waited for him. How would he change from one unit to another? For instance, when he went on patrol with you, mm -hmm. did he simply say to you, uh, Lieutenant, I'd, I'd like to be with you, or, or was it simply taken for granted that he'd come along? Well, he actually slipped out of the uh, out of the position we were in <laughs> and followed by platoon on patrol until it was too late for us to tell him to go back. Is how he did it with me. I don't know how he did it with with the other folks, but he would just show up and uh, he had an aura about him. I I think that even the colonel was reluctant to uh, argue with. And uh, he wouldn't ask permission at all. Of well, he didn't to me. He just <laughs> went. <laughs> Capadano. Uh, in some ways rallied the troops because they were kind of frozen initially. But he was the first one to move, apparently, at least this is what I'm told. Mm -hmm. And his movement was, was such that he, he went from man to man and he encouraged them and he would pray with them. And those who were wounded, of course, he'd pray with them and give them the blessing. Nobody ever came there. I mean, we'd get ammunition and stuff like that, but nothing else. And a chaplain, Father Vincent, jumped off the chapel. It was a surprise to see him there. And he came over and talked to me in particular. Uh, and I just, I was shocked that a priest would go that far to see That's one it. person. He would come all the way there to mm -hmm. see me. Did it have the same effect on all of the men? I would say it probably did, yeah. Mm -hmm. now, there were certain people who won't listen, though. I mean, there, you've always got that. Sure. But I think nobody ever turned Father Vincent down. The men wanted him out there. Uh, we were afraid when he was out there, and we really didn't want mm -hmm. him there, but he was a relief to see mm -hmm. when things got bad. 
Uh, anybody, Your Excellency, that ever tells you they've never been afraid in combat, I'd like to meet them when you do on it, <laughs> because I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll do their job. They are absolutely fearless in doing their mm -hmm. job. But before and after comes a time and a peaceful time mm -hmm. where you contemplate and you're afraid. And you're afraid of the next time it's going to happen. The mm -hmm. first reaction is, I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be sure. a flesh wound, and, mm -hmm. and any wound is serious, obviously. Yeah. But it, it, it could not be like a wound would maybe not be life threatening, mm -hmm. but they would be concerned about that. They would be worried about that. And he understood that, that 10 minutes ago, maybe this man was fighting and doing mm -hmm. his job and doing it very well. And now he was a very, very young boy, mm -hmm. hurt. Mm -hmm. And he wanted, to, he wanted to share with them and he wanted to show the compassion and often mm -hmm. wanted to bring the law to them. I believe that his previous tour of duty as a marinol in, in, uh, in China, in Taiwan, mm -hmm. and in those villages helped set that mood because he had done that for a number of years. He totally understood that, that the military presence was only one dimension of our being in Vietnam and that we had to really care for the people and that meant understanding them, mm -hmm. and particularly understanding their culture. His whole body and mind was in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He was here with us, mm -hmm. but he was over there also. Mm -hmm. We were located on a hill called Hill 51, out in the Quezon Valley. We were surrounded by approximately 2,500 men. People were screaming, people were dying. Mm -hmm. um, we were being overrun. It's, you know, it's a, they shoot at anything that moves. So he came to where the need was greatest, and I don't mm -hmm. think he needed anybody's permission to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you might say he answered to a higher calling. Building a house for Mary right over here. First stage is on the way. Um, as Dr. Rosie said, I was kind of eyeballing, we'll see that little tiny house over there. I was kind of eyeballing one of those because I thought it'd be nice. But what had happened, uh, good old Dr. Rosalie said, very nice, wonderful spot, great idea, but too small. It's got to be bigger, bigger, bigger. And then that's praying Holy Spirit said she was right. It's got to be bigger. So uh, so we have enough to start it anyway. So we're starting it, and then the Lord will provide after that, right? So we'll kind of... We have enough money to support it, but we need more money to build it. We got one-fifteenth of what we need. So we'll get it there. So the Lord Our Lady will... But we depend on the Lord and providence. Very good. And... Be sure to like us on Facebook. Download our free Focus TV app.